to deserve even one of the pleasures I've
today. We're going to be praying and asking God to give us a message. Everybody's going to be asking Jesus to say to them tonight what he wants us to hear. And they're going to be asking that God will help me to say what we need to hear tonight. Let's bow heads as we talk to Jesus tonight. one more time. Oh, Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God. Yes, Lord, that's our prayer tonight. And as we wait before you, you may hold us near to your heart. Holy Spirit, may you do a work tonight. Feel free to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment and point us to Jesus. And may we truly be revived. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday we spoke about building our lives on solid ground. We still remember that? I'm not. Oh, there we go. We spoke about building our lives on on solid on the solid ground of the word of God as the best way to prepare for the end times. We must Read, study, memorize, and apply God's word to every aspect of our lives, to every circumstance in our lives, to every belief, every doctrine, every philosophy, we must demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. We must truly be the people of the book as seventh day adventists and when we do so our lives will be grounded 
on solid ground. We learned yesterday that we must live our lives not according to culture, but according to scripture. And I hope that we were challenged yesterday to begin to evaluate our lives. The videos that we watch, the music that we listen to, the clothes that we wear, the kind of people that we hang out with, every belief, everything that we do must be grounded in the word of God. Tonight I'll be speaking about real revival. There we go. The title for tonight is, is what? Real Revival. And it's based on the chapter in the Great Controversy titled Modern Revivals. Um, my slides may not look as beautiful as they did yesterday, but I hope you will still get something from it. From the year 20... 10. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been emphasizing the need for revival and reformation. The Seventh-day Adventist Church all over the world, led by the General Conference, have been praying and emphasizing the need for revival and reformation. We even had a whole lesson study, a Sabbath school lesson that was titled Revival and Reformation. Different initiatives, programs have been designed and implemented to enhance revival in the personal life, in the life of church members, in the life of families, in the life of the church, and in the life of community. Though revival is a common word in Christendom today, even in this predominantly Christian country of Jamaica, I still like to share with you tonight what the word revival means, what it looks like, and the two major types of revivals that we have, and what we can, what we can do to experience real revival. Are we together, church? The English word revival, which is a noun, is derived from the verb revive. Are we together? And those two words, revive, come from two Latin words, re for again, and uh, vive or vivere, which means to live. So revival means to live again. Are we together? Yes, I, I, I'm not sure what is happening to the slide. Is it's working? I'm not sure where to be pointing it to now because it's just there. Okay. I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. All right. There we go. All right. So we have the word re, which is again. And we have the word vive, which is to live. So revival essentially has to do with bringing something that once was dead or faint back to life. Okay? A restoration of life. To live again. So revival is the act of reviving the state of being revived, the reawakening of something or someone back to life. Um, to make it a little bit more practical, we have, we have that picture up there. What, when the car dies, when there is no fuel, the car stops working. Or when the, the battery dies and needs to be recharged so that the car comes back to life. But most importantly is when a human being is 
no longer responding to to life there we go anybody knows what that is called what is what is being put on the heart on the chest of the man anybody knows what that is called yes this has a very long special name a defibrillator okay and that's what you put on the heart of someone that looks dead and it's filled with electric current so that when it goes into the person person can come back to life so those are pictures modern day pictures of what a revival is one of my favorite stories in the bible that describes what a revival looks like with actually a resurrection but uh, a revival is in ezekiel 37 and i want the whole church to go to that passage with me we're going to read it together like we did yesterday alternately ezekiel 37 from verse 1 to 14 and so i'm going to read verse 1 and you're going to read verse 2 and we're going to keep reading like that until we get to verse 14 and i hope that by the time we finish reading you would catch the picture of what a revival is ezekiel 37 is about the valley of dry bones in the new king james version ezekiel 37 verse 1 says the hand of the lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones everyone verse 2 Verse 3, and he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Verse 4. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live verse 6 verse 7 so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone verse 8 Verse 9, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Verse 10. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 11, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Verse 12. Verse 13, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Last verse, verse 14. Amen. What do you say, church? beautiful picture powerful picture god is able to transform a valley of dry bones into a living army and that is what 
the church needs today. When Ezekiel obeyed God's command, God caused a revival. And this dead army came back to life. By the power of God's word declared by Ezekiel and by the breath of God's spirit. I want you to note those two things. For revival to take place, the, these two things must be present. The word of God and the Holy Spirit. And when those two come together, revival will be the result. All right, there we go. And so I want to say right here that revival is not brought about by any preacher. Revival is God's work. Only God truly revives. He is the only true revivalist. All right, that's, that's actually a real word, okay, in the dictionary. A revivalist. Now, in the Christian world today, there are re all kinds of revivals across the land. There are genuine revivals, and there are counterfeit revivals. How do we know the difference between the two? We touched that a little bit yesterday. We can know the difference by what? The word of God. That's right. The word of God can distinguish the, 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 the two. Uh, Elder Damien, I'm just going to raise my hand and you, you move it for me. Okay? Thank you. I have some pictures there of some revivals. All right? There we go. That's, that's some of what we have in the, in the land today. But revival must be based on the Word of God. And so I want to I take us to the Word of God to see what revival truly is. There are two kinds of people, two kinds of living. And I want us to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. It presents to us the fact that the world, in the world, there are two major kind of people. Romans 8 verse 5 and 6 says, For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded that's to to live according to the flesh is what church is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace so there are those who live their lives according to the flesh and what does flesh mean they live selfishly they live to please themselves and they do not rely on jesus by faith but then there are others who live their lives according to the spirit and they rely on Jesus. According to Galatians 2.20, it says, I'm crucified with Christ and not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the son of God who gave himself for me. And all of us in this church are in one of those two classes. We're either living according to the flesh or according to the spirit. And I hope that at the end of this message, we will be able to sincerely evaluate as my brother who prayed earlier, who did the prayer tower pointed out. We need to, to reflect, to do some introspection and find out where we stand. All right. Real revival takes place when a person turns from being dead in self and sin and becomes what? Alive to the things of God. And as we continue, we're going to appreciate that statement 
a little more. This is made possible by the person of the Holy Spirit. So church, we cannot have revival without the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the active divine agent that can bring us back from death to life. I want to emphasize three things that the Holy Spirit does to make sure that real revival comes into the life of a person. One is that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. John 16 verse 8. And what is sin? 1 John 3 verse 4 says sin is what? The transgression of the law. When we break God's law, we sin. And as I was reflecting today, I was reflecting on some sins. One very common one is hating our brother or sister. Did you know that hating your brother or sister breaks the sixth commandment? What is the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Did you know that? I'm not saying that from my head. I have a Bible text right here to prove it. 1 John 3 verse 15. And I want to read it quickly as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. 1 John 3, 14 and 15 says, For we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Verse 15 is the punchline now. Whoever hates his brother is what? Is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him so what the spirit does is that the holy spirit points out to us you hate your brother you are breaking the law of god you are guilty of sin and you need a savior friends what about spending time Watching things that are not pleasing to God. Spending time doing things that are not honoring to God. What commandment do you think that breaks? The first one. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Do you know that I can make myself God when I place myself above God I become God when I do my own things instead of God's things I become my own God I participate in what is called self worship many times when we think about idols we, 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 we don't think about that fact but when I spend the time God has given me and the resources God has given me to do my own things then I am breaking his commands one of the greatest commandments is love the Lord your God with what? with with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind love him with everything give him the best of everything but when we use God's blessings for our own purposes we become idolatrous. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to point that out to us. To help us see that we are guilty of that sin. And to recognize that we need to change. And when we recognize that we need to change, the result is repentance. And what is repentance? A turning away from sin. A sorrow for sin that leads to a turning away from sin. This repentance is not a false repentance that is afraid of punishment. I remember when I was a kid and I would get in trouble. And my father had a very special stick. 
Yes, to, 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 to punish us when we, you know, to give us some, some spanking. What do you call it here in Jamaica? What do you call it? Huh? A, a whip. No, no, what do you call it when you, when you uh, uh, spank a child? You beat him. Oh, you, call, you say beat him. I thought there was a special patois expression for that. All right. <laughs> and so you lick him. Yeah, okay. That, that's, that's a little uh, uh, familiar now. All right. And, and so when I knew that I was going to be licked, I began to cry and say, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it again. But you all know why I was saying that, right? I was saying that so that I wouldn't get licked. But that is not genuine repentance. You do not get, we do not feel sorry because you're going to get in trouble. You feel sorry because you recognize that the sin you committed broke the heart of Jesus. Recognize that sin hurts the heart of God. And to show genuine repentance, we must change our ways. And that is what reformation is. And so the Holy Spirit helps us recognize that we have broken the law. That we have broken the law by hating our brother and we need to stop it. We need to recognize that because it is not pleasing to God, we must stop it. The next thing that the Spirit of God does is that he testifies of Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. He points us to the fact that yes, though we are sinners, there is a Savior. And though the law shows us that we are guilty, we can turn to the Savior to cleanse us from sin. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, what? If we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all our sins unrighteousness praise his name and so the holy spirit places a spotlight on jesus and after he shows us our sin he provides the solution he points us to the solution jesus christ so that we may be forgiven the third thing that the holy spirit does is that he empowers us to fulfill god's law he gives us power to fulfill god's law he fills our hearts with divine love. And Romans 13 verse 8 to 10 says that love is the fulfilling of the law. Friends, do you know it is possible to keep God's law without love? When you keep God's law without love, you are not fulfilling the law. It is possible for you to have a checklist and say, oh, I did not curse today. I did not lie today. You can do all that. Keep, as Paul says, the letter of the law and miss the spirit of the law. There's some people who uh, uh, would not uh, brush their teeth or take a bath on the Sabbath or warm any food on the Sabbath. Uh, they keep the Sabbath very strictly and still miss the spirit of the Sabbath. And so friends, no human being can keep the law in their own strength. The Holy Spirit fills our hearts with power to do God's will. And so when real revival takes place, God's law is upheld and fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit. What about false revival? False revival in false revival, the law of God is disregarded. There's a popular belief that Jesus has nailed the law to the cross. Church, as I studied, as I prepared for this sermon, I was blessed by the, how powerful this law thing is. Here's a quotation. It says, many religious teachers assert that Christ by his death abolish the law and men are free from its requirements there are some that present the law as a grievous yoke and in contrast to the bondage of the law they present the liberty to be enjoyed under the, the gospel in other words when you believe in jesus you don't need to keep the law anymore but what's the result of that 
before we go to the result of that is that biblically correct no and that brings us to yesterday's sermon you see we must test everything by the word of god Here's what the quotation says. It says, The claim that Christ by his death abolished his father's law is without foundation. Had it been possible for the law to be changed, Christ would not have needed to die. The fact that Christ died proves that the law is unchangeable. Powerful thought. So church, that means... Without law, there is no sin. And without sin, there is no need for a savior. Did you get that, church? Without law, there is no sin. And without sin, there is no need for a savior. So if there was no law, then Jesus did not need to die. But the good news is that Jesus died. And because he died, the law still stands. But what is the result now of disregarding the law of God? The result is there is no repentance, no reformation, no change in the life. And, and the next quotation reveals something powerful. It says the neglect of these truths has opened the door to the evils which are now becoming so widespread in the religious world. Because the nature and importance of the law of God has been lost sight of, there is lack of the spirit and power in revivals today. Without the law, men have no just conception of the purity and the holiness of God or their own guilt. You see, without the law, you can't even know that you're a sinner. They have no true conviction of sin. They feel no need of repentance. They accept, they hope that they will be saved without change of heart or reformation of life. And as a result of that, there is superficial conversion. And multitudes are joined to the church who have never been united to Christ. Church, are you with me tonight? There's revival all over the place. People come into Jesus. But what are they being told? They're being told all you have to do is believe. And when you believe that, that then the law of God is done away with, you can live anyhow you want. And therefore it is no surprise that even though Jamaica is a Christian nation, there's still a lot of evil in the world. Evil in the land perpetuated by Christians people who should know better are you seeing it church when the, when the foundation of God's law is removed then it opens the door for all kinds of sin and that is what we are seeing today and Lord have mercy as a result there is a a prosperity of carnal Christianity. Carnal Christianity. Christians that live their lives according to the flesh. Comfortable with sin. They have more interest in the things of the world than in the things of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 says they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. And that is the kind of Christianity that we see in the world today. False revival produces such kind of Christians. Here's this quotation. It says, the power of godliness has well nigh departed from many of the churches. Picnics and church theatricals, church fairs, fine houses, personal display have banished thoughts of God. Lands and goods and worldly occupation engross the mind. And things of eternal interest receive hardly a passing notice. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world. Are we together? Matthew 23. I want us to read that passage so that you can understand the picture that is on the screen right now. Matthew 23 
verse 27 and 28. Matthew 23, 27 and 28 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Verse 28, even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Carnal Christians are what Jesus calls whitewashed sepulchers that look good on the outside but are dead on the inside and need a revival. Christians that are walking dead. Walking dead. And while many of these Christians, many of these churches are filled with emotional activity, filled with the spectacular, the truth is that they are actually experiencing a false revival and they are dead according to scripture. What about us Seventh-day Adventists? We need a revival. And here are three points on the screen for why we need a revival. Number one, we love the things of the world more than the things of God. We trust in self more than we trust in God. That is a book that I want everybody to read. I, I hope you can see it. It's titled Steps to Personal Revival and you can get a free PDF copy online. It's a powerful book. It's a book that every Seventh-day Adventist needs to read. One of the things I learned from that book that it is possible for you to be very active in church and still be a carnal Christian. It is possible for you to teach a powerful Sabbath school lesson, preach a sermon like I'm doing now, be able to sing beautifully, be able to do a lot of things and still be a carnal Christian. When we rely so much on ourselves, on what we can do, on our plans, then we are carnal Christians. And what is the result of that? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4 gives us another sign for being carnal. 1 Corinthians 3, I'm going to read verse 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and 4 says, For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Verse 4, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Friends, the cause of the fighting in the church is carnal Christianity. The cause of fighting and division in the church is carnal Christianity. It's when we want to do things our own way, rather than depending on, on what the Holy Spirit would have us do. And so church, we need a revival. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We have the truth, the present truth. But we are in need of a real revival. And what does that look like? The book of Acts tells us in Acts chapter 2. Let's read that together, church, as um, I, stri I strive to, to wrap up. Acts chapter 2. Let's all go there together and read from verse 42 to 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. We're going to read alternately as we look at what it, a church looks like when it is revived. I'll read verse 42, you read verse 43, and so on until we get to 47. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 43, church. Verse 
Verse 44, and now all who believed were together and they had all things in common. Verse 45. Forty-six. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Verse 47. Amen. That's what the, that's what the revived church looks like. A revived church loves the word of God. They love Bible class. They love Sabbath school. They are not tired of hearing and talking about the word of God. A revived church loves worship and loves prayer. They are never tired of praying. I don't know if you have met Christians who say you pray too much. <laughs> Lord have mercy. That's a sign. You pray too much. People get tired of praying. Lord I'm talking about private personal prayers i'm not talking about long public prayers i don't believe in long public prayers except it is a specific prayer meeting okay but i believe that christians need to linger in prayer because god answers prayers and i'm coming to that at the end the church was united in love love for god and love for one another Imagine a church where a kid needs school fees and someone provides. Another church member provides that, that fee because God has blessed them with that. It was such a church where everybody helped everybody and the church was united in love. The church found favor in the community. The church was known and was loved by the community and finally the church grew daily in number the church of acts was revived because each member was fully surrendered to and led by the holy spirit before the holy spirit came down on the day of pentecost the the people of god had to do a deep heart searching repent and confess and surrender church there there is a condition for real revival and we must meet those conditions in order to receive revival. Remember that before the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were always fighting. Who will be the greatest? Peter says, I'm going to be the prime minister when Jesus takes over the kingdom. The, John said no. Judah said no. They were always fighting amongst each other. But when Jesus went to heaven and they were in that upper room for 10 days, each one was confessing, Lord, forgive me. I was short-sighted. I didn't know what I was doing. And out of their personal convictions, they, Peter went to John and apologized. And they, the disciples were apologizing to one another. I'm sorry because I said this against you. And they began to be reconciled and create room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit church the same thing can happen today if every member at waltham would humble themselves would ask god to forgive to change to transform and we do what is necessary but church i must say it as i reflected on this topic tonight that we are not experiencing real revival because we don't really want it We are satisfied with half-hearted, carnal Christianity. We are satisfied with a Christianity where self rules and is exalted. We are satisfied with a Christianity where sin is cherished. We are satisfied with a Christianity that claims the favor of heaven without complying with the condition. An easy religion that requires no self-denial, no striving, no divorce from worldliness. But what is the result of that kind of Christianity? Death. That's what the Bible says. We read it earlier. Death. And so church, 
God calls us tonight to stop being comfortable in death. To stop being comfortable doing things as usual. For if we are going to live again, if we are going to be revived, then we have to do things unusually. We have to stop living as usual and begin to pray and work for real revival and stop just surviving. For that is what we are doing now, just surviving. But God calls us to enjoy the abundant life of the Holy Spirit. What can we do to experience this real revival? We must be thirsty for it. We must hunger and thirst for it. Have you seen someone who is hungry and really needs food? Scrambling, doing everything that they can to get it. We need to be thirsty for revival and strive for it. Here are some other conditions for revival. We must be totally surrendered to God. Self must be totally surrendered to God. Here's a quotation that says, Revival is needed, but why are we not receiving it? We're not receiving it because God knows that we are not ready to receive it. We're not ready to receive it. God is not going to give his special gift of the Holy Spirit just anyhow. We must be ready to receive it. And what can we do to receive it? Here are a few things very quickly as I strive to come to the end of this message. Number one, total surrender of self to God. Number two, total obedience to God's word. And number three, we must pray persistently, personally and as a church for revival, for real revival. Let's just keep going. Keep going. We must obey God's word. Let me, let me read that one. It says, God cannot reveal himself till those who profess to be Christians are doers of his word in their private lives. Till there is oneness with Christ, a sanctification of body, soul, and spirit. Then they will be fit temples for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We must be doers of the word. We must be obedient to the word. And when we do, what must we do in obedience? We must repent. We must get rid of pride and self-reliance, critical, vengeful spirit, worldliness, victory over addictions. We must do those things. We must learn to pray persistently. Our Heavenly Father is willing to give us this gift but we must prepare to receive it. We must work to receive it. We must humble ourselves, repent, and fulfill the conditions. For revival will come only in answer to prayer. In order to have a revival, we must remove every obstacle and hindrance in our relationship with God to make us fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So what is it in our lives that we cling to that obstructs our hearts from God? Is it a habit? Is it a possession? Is it a relationship, confession, humiliation, and repentance? They are simply the act of the soul in letting go of what obstructs our hearts from God. If we want a revival, then we must let help Jesus answer our prayers by letting go. I want to end with this story that was told by this man, Pastor Pavel Goyer. And I want to encourage you to look for his, this particular video on YouTube. It's titled, The Holy Spirit and Prayer, Part 1. Pavel Goya was assigned to a church in Lexington in the United States. A church where they did not believe in evangelism. A church where they told him, Pastor, we have not done evangelism. We don't believe in evangelism. A church where they just kept their members. Church board, everything was fine, but there was no evangelism. And so pastor began to pray and say, God, what can, 
what can I do so that revival can take place in this church? And he began to pray persistently for many months. He prayed. And one day it was time for a church board meeting. He was praying and God had already given him the vision of what he wanted the church to do. And so he went for the church board meeting that day and he said, Church, the Holy Spirit has revealed to me what we need to do in this church so that people can come in. And the church members asked him, what did the Holy Spirit reveal to you? He said, you go and ask him. I want you all to go home and pray that what the Holy Spirit revealed to me, he will reveal to you. And the church members began to rebel. They said, oh, pastor, but we have a church board meeting. The agenda has already been set. We need to do this and we need to do that. Pastor says, I am the chair of the church board and I am canceling the meeting. Go home and pray. And one of the members of the church stood up and said, pastor, I have been in this church for many years and we have never canceled a church board meeting so if you don't want to stay for the church board meeting go home and we will have the church board meeting and the pastor said go and ask the conference to send you another pastor and when they saw that the pastor was serious they went home to pray they were not happy but they went home to pray and the pastor began to call each one of them on the phone and began to pray with them one by one began to pray with them that the Holy Spirit would reveal to them what had been revealed to him and the church members later said pastor we've never had a pastor that has prayed for us on the phone like this before and what the pastor was doing to the members the members began to do for one another and the church became a praying church and from a praying church became a loving church and the conflicts in the church began to disappear and church members began to spend time praying for one another until God revealed the plan to them Amen. and friends that church just became a shining light in that city when they began to live by the plan that God had revealed to them Friends, there are a lot of things that we can do when we allow God to do what he wants to do in our lives. One of the points he made was we need to stop making our own plans and ask God for his plans. Sometimes in meetings we just have a five minute devotion just to fulfill all righteousness and then we pursue our own agenda that church is carnal Christianity and if we keep doing that the church will not be able to accomplish what God would have it accomplish we need to spend more time putting our agendas aside and praying and praying like we mean it and praying wholeheartedly and saying Lord we don't have any plans tell us what you want us to do make it clear to us and friends I've seen that happen many times in church board meetings where we spend time in prayer we don't fight very much we don't stay long in those meetings because you see there's a unity that comes when we spend time praying together when a brother makes a point, the, the sister supports it and says, that's the same thing I was thinking. Why? Because the Spirit of God put it there. And you notice that when you spend time in prayer, we save time. But when we think spending time with God is a waste of time, we waste time. I know you know what I'm talking about sitting in those church board meetings where you're stuck on one agenda and everybody's saying different things and the meeting becomes confusing and people get angry and you're not making any headway that's because you are running the meeting yourselves but when you put that aside and let the spirit of God make the agenda 
Let the Spirit of God impress upon our hearts what He wants us to do. There will be unity in the church. There will be love in the church. God's agenda will be fulfilled in that church. And so, dear friends, it is my prayer that we will experience real revival, but there's a work to do. If we really want revival, we must pray for it. And we must work for it. And God will send it. If you're here tonight and you are like me, saying, Lord, I've been a carnal Christian. I've done things my own way for too long. And Lord, I'm asking you to please help me to surrender myself completely to you, to allow you to do what you want to do in my life. Can you please stand with me? Because I'm already standing. Stand with me as we pray. I know that it is late. We've gone beyond the time I promised to close, but I hope you're not standing just because of that. I hope you are sincerely responding to what the Spirit of God is saying to you and to me tonight. You and I know the things that we're holding on to. Holding on to pride. Holding on to bitterness. Holding on to an unforgiving spirit. There are sins that we cherish and we don't want to let them go. We want to hold on to Jesus and hold on to that sin at the same time but look, we know the truth we know it cannot work like that we either have one or the other we're asking Jesus tonight to help us let go of everything that stands in the way of allowing the spirit of God to move mightily in our lives let us pray silently everyone as we ask God to set us free and bring into our lives real revival. Is there anyone here tonight who wants to say for the first time, Jesus, help me. I have lived my life my own way. I want to live my life your way now. I want you to come up front and we pray. I want to, I want to pray especially tonight for the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church, come and let's pray together because we are guilty many times of this carnal Christianity leading the church the way we want to lead it when the Holy Spirit is there to, to work through us. Leaders of the church, wherever you are, if you are convicted by God's Spirit, I want you to come up here as we confess together the need to overcome carnal Christianity. Come this is about you and God now. Not about any church member. Not about anything. Come. We're here together to say, Lord, help us. Help us. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the porter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. 
Yes, Lord, that is our prayer tonight, that you would have your own sweet way in our lives, that you would take away from us, Lord, those things that we are holding on to, that there will be nothing between our soul and the Savior, that, Lord, you will help us remove every false God in our lives, even the God of self, that you will allow you to work in us to live out your life within us by the power of your spirit. Lord, in a special way tonight, I lift up the leaders of Waltham Church, the ones you have chosen to lead this church in the path of your righteousness. Oh, Father, I ask that you forgive us of carnal Christianity. Forgive us of pushing our own agendas and not consulting you and allowing you to do what you want to do. I pray that from tonight, Lord, we may earnestly seek your plans, your will, your vision for Waltham Church. And that you may help us, Lord, to implement those visions for your honor and glory. Father, bless every member tonight, everyone who has heard this message. Even me, Lord, who is speaking this message, bring a real revival to our lives. For that is the only way we can truly be prepared for the end time thank you for hearing this prayer tonight thank you for your word again we pray with thanksgiving in jesus name amen god bless you